Okay, good to go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Hi, hello, everybody. Nice to be sitting with you and sharing the Dharma with you. I'm um, exploring the Dharma together, and I'll make some points and um, take them as you will and see, uh, you know, how you could improve on them by all means, please. Just uh, pointers to um, help us in our in our lives and guide us toward greater kindness and less harm, more love and more lives that are open to witnessing um, witnessing this world and calling out its injustices, seeing them and being able to do that without reactivity, offering calm to the world in its turmoil. Um, and you know the source of um, the source of that redu kind of reduced reactivity are, are on various levels. You know, there's um, <clears throat> there's our basic practice. You know, the last several months I've been teaching again and again that there are different levels of practice, different levels of um, <clears throat> of growth as human beings, different levels of training, as Buddha called it, you know, training the worldling, you know, sometimes talked about untrained worldlings. And there are different levels of training and they all have their place and they're all valuable. And it's one of the hazards of the world of spirituality that um, some school or tradition that Inevitably, you know, they tend to get an emphasis. What they tend to develop an emphasis in one zone, you know, one level, and then they dis disparage or under un undervalue other levels of practice. And so, I'm trying to be uh, teaching in a way that acknowledges the value of many levels of practice, many levels of growth, many levels of healing. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm saying many, but actually I usually think it's four. So it's not that many, <laughs> but that's a very broad categorization that I'm making. And um, I have to acknowledge that that's only my way of trying to, um, trying to parse out, you know, a complex field. And um, if somebody tells me I'm completely wrong, I'm, I'd be very open to acknowledging that that might be true. The question is, what's helpful as well, you know? And so I think that this sense of sort of seeing as, as different, yeah, different levels of practice and growth is helpful, I believe, you know? So excuse me, just a moment. I'm gonna put up a card over my screen. Much It's really, really nice to see everybody. Um, actually, having just said that, I know there's quite a lot of people with their cameras off, but it's nice to see everybody who has their camera on. I, I totally understand it, by the way. And um, yeah, hi, 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 hi. Okay, just a moment. <laughs> now I have to cover the screen. Um, <clears throat> I just got back today, actually, from four months out of Santa Fe. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's how wonderful it is to be back here, man. After being in a congested place, um, <clears throat> it wasn't a particularly easy time for various personal reasons, um, you know, just uh, situations that we're dealing with in our family. But um, <clears throat> it was it was very necessary and helpful, very good thing um, to have been away. But um, to come back here, man, it's so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. Just you know, climbing up in in western Arizona you know, out of the, the desert, back up onto the, the high, the high plains in, in Arizona and the, oh, the vastness. And just um, yesterday we, we got as far as uh, Eastern Arizona, actually, 
um, in Navajo Nation. We're just um, walking around, you know, just a, a bare street, quiet street in a tiny place, Holbrook. I don't know if any of you know it. There's uh, not a whole lot there, um, um, at least to one passing through briefly. Maybe there's a whole lot that I don't know about. Um, <clears throat> so beautiful. And um, and then on today, we, we got home to this, this after, early afternoon. So I'm a little bit sort of dazzled, you know. Um, but what I basically want to do tonight is just two yeah. things. Uh, I want to read a little piece about Zen, short, just a little, I don't know what to call it, snippet. And then I want to answer, to the best of my ability, some of the questions that we, we didn't get to in the last retreat. So um, I'm going to start with a little, I don't know what to call it, a little bit of prose. Zen loves the world. It doesn't just want us to learn to be more peaceful citizens and kinder neighbors and better denizens so that the world may be a better home to all its beings and flourish. It wants us to know how beautiful the world is. It doesn't offer a teaching over here about how human beings can be trained in positive ways. And meanwhile, over here, in another zone entirely, there's a beautiful world. It wants us to be better humans in this beauty of the world. Imagine the hazy breakers of a Pacific beach at the end of an afternoon. It's as if hair is streaming back from the waves as they plunge toward the beach. And the air is misty with spray and that mist is suffused with light. It has become a golden mist, illuminated as if from within by the late sun. Through this haze comes a line of slow flapping pelicans. The big birds beat their way up the strand, swerving to and fro into the face of the swells as the swells rise into walls, growing taller and taller and just as they're about to break into white avalanches of spume, the line of birds swerve again and reform and spread wide as they veer up along the beach only to swerve once again. It's like watching a, a group of words write itself into a single coherent sentence. And then the angle changes and they spread too wide apart and break apart. Then once again, they come close enough to once again be read as a single sentence. Now they move across the blinding path where the low sun dazzles on the water. They flicker through it, becoming barely visible as if no more than a flapping without any ostensible solid thing that is creating the movement. On the far side of the broad highway of light, once again, they become a set of objects in motion. How is it that there can be a sight of such grace, such grandeur, as this broad stretch of breaking waves and of these great birds flying as one, then as separate eminences, and then once again as one. What is this world that it can offer such beauty? Whatever it is, Zen is that. Zen is not us not our minds to be examined and known more intimately. Zen is our minds knowing such beauty. Zen is the mind of beauty. When we know that, we know Zen.
<clears throat> I mean, maybe I just need to sort of justify that strange piece a little bit. You know, the word Zen, it does come from jhana or jhana, you know, and the, the jhana states, so-called, uh, this very rarefied um, kind of samadhi practice. They're the, samadhi is a more general term for meaning unification um, of mind, heart, being. Um, and within the general category samadhi, there's a finer grained categorization of states of absorption known as the jhanas. And it's that word actually that, that um, traveled from India to China as, as dhyana Buddhism. You know, and I'm sure many of you know this piece of etymology and that dhyana became chan or chana and then chan and then zen. So the very name is absorption Buddhism. It's kind of, um, and that's always been taken to signify that, you know, this kind of practice is more about meditation than about say scriptural study or other forms of Buddhist practice that might be more liturgical or whatever, you know, doctrinal, study that type of thing um and um but what are those jhana states what well I, I, without i don't want to go into them in detail now but there are four jhanas that are with form and four jhanas that are formless but basically the the way the flavor of them is ever increasing um joy rapture then equanimity and boundless peace and greater and greater suffusing stillness and moving toward one boundless awareness toward one boundless space spaciousness one boundless nothing at all and so on so there they're very, very deep states of meditative absorption, but they're very beautiful. They make life, well, they're kind of, um, they make us recognize um, the wonder of existing at all very vividly. To, to be uh, whatever this consciousness is and to know that it, although it, we take it to be limited by this body, this mind, this person, it isn't really at all. It's boundless. Consciousness itself has really no edges. And these jhana states know that. Oh, we, you know, we know that when we're in them. And in that, um, all appearances are, are actually made beautiful. Um, well, we see that they are beautiful. We see that there's um, an extraordinary kind of immaculate order in things arising at all. And that beauty has a, has an effect on, on us as people. It sort of alchemizes something in our souls, in our hearts, that makes us want to be agents of non-harm, agents of healing if we possibly can be, agents of um, flourishing where we can, be, delighting in the well-being of others you know, and pained by the suffering of others. And, you know, in the old um, analogies, the, the, the strongest statement of it is that, you know, it's like being a parent who is so pained by the suffering of their children that this, this kind of um, development can lead to that kind of sense of seeing the suffering of other beings. Um, but not without the beauty you know, if it's just 
remorseless suffering, you know, um, and we, and there's no, um, they say the Bodhisattva, you know, is acutely attuned to suffering of others and really motivated by it. Their compassionate heart is responding to it, but they see the world as beautiful. And the further they go on the 51 ranks of bodhisattva hood that traditionally there are said to be, the more beautiful the world seems. And, you know, we all are granted um, at the very least glimpses, often, you know, more than just a brief glimpse, where we, where we see the beauty of this world. And it's, a, it's kind of powerful. It's not just like a, oh yeah, there's something nice, move on. No, it's actually, usually when we really, you know, have a, an experience of beauty, it's, it's quite a big deal for us. It's, it, it can, um, it can uh, adjust our perspective on life. And you could say, you could say something like, um, it's a training in, you know, they, it, I was going to say something like, it's a training in beauty. But, I mean, that's, that's uh, I think that's a little bit too radical, but it's, it is, that's an aspect of it. For, for sure, for real, the world becoming more beautiful. And that's not to be denying suffering, injustice, inequity, um, but it's giving the context in which perhaps we can more effectively work on, on behalf of the oppressed and those who suffer most and helping. Okay, so look, that's my little sort of... Uh, <clears throat> spiel hold on just a sec i, I want to readjust my i'm on uh i've just you know i just grabbed um i'm basically i'm on a bolster and it's i need to just fiddle with it hold on <clears throat> okay so <clears throat> I'm going to take a look at um, excuse me, some of these uh, these questions from the last retreat. By the way, um, just a huge thanks to Valerie doing the leading the intro retreat this weekend. Valerie's been doing an, a lot of uh, just giving so much to Mountain Cloud. Thank you so much, Valerie, and it's ongoing. <laughs> um, this next retreat, um, this is just this weekend, so. Um, you know, doesn't matter if you're, you don't have to be a newcomer to do it, but if you are, it's a great way to deepen your practice and to get, you know, start to get more involved. And if you're a long time sitter, it's just great. Two days of sitting um, with a very, very deep guide. And that'll be, you know, be a fantastic experience. Um, then uh, I think as Christian was saying, at the end of the month, we'll have this one that um, is called Why Moo? And we're, we're just, um, Valerie and I are just talking about, I mean, it's, it may be that, be that because she's just done so much that, I don't, I don't know, we'll, we'll discuss it, but it seems like it might be that basically I'll leave that one, that four day. Um, but we, we're not quite clear on, that, clear on that at the moment. But so watch this space, probably, I mean, either it'll be led by both of us or it may turn out in the end to be led by myself. Um, so sort of watch this space, but it's, it's, it's happening for sure. Um, so, um, questions. Zen teachings speak about koans as barriers. And you have spoken beautifully about koans pointing to our hearts like spears, opening us once the sense of a separate self dissolves. Would you please speak more about how these descriptions of koans compare? They seem to be about finally seeing through constructs we've mistaken as reality slash true nature. What dissolves the constructs, the koan or that which is facing the wall? Um, that, that last question was because we were, we were looking at this particular koan, Rosso faces the wall in the retreat. 
So the last part is what dissolves the construct? So it seems to be that these descriptions, whether it's a barrier or whether it's like a spear pointing at our hearts, uh, opening us up once the sense of a separate self dissolves. Um, so they seem to be about finally seeing through constructs we've mistaken as reality, true nature. What dissolves the constructs? The koan or that which is facing the wall. But the thing is, the point about the constructs from the koan point of view and from the point of view of awakening, frankly, the point about the constructs, this is the real point. There's nothing to dissolve. That's the real point. We have been hoodwinked by mirages. And it's not only koans and it's not only Zen saying this. In the, you know, the, 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 the I was going to say famous, I think it is sort of famous, old, early Buddhist deconstruction or analysis of self-experience. There's the five skandhas, the, you know, the form or certainly the body, number one. Number two, um, feeling. That means, you know, the sensations arising in the body, including the, 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 the all six sense channels, you know, seeing, hearing, etc., touch, etc. You know, the, 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 this body and all these experiences arise in the sense channels. And every single one has a sort of valency. It's either pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. And those are the, that's the second scandal, feelings, sensations. And then the third one is usually translated perception, but it really means recognition. It's kind of seeing what things are, you know, the, the filter that knows, oh, this is a piece of paper, you know, um, or this is white and it's got black marks on it. You know, that, that would also be the third scandal. And then the fourth scandal is, Basically, the way we, we respond, the responses, reactions that we have, it's sometimes called will because it's, it's you know, what we're pro how we're prompted to respond or act to the input of the first three. And the fifth scandal is the consciousness that is the uh, sort of space in which all the others arise, hosts all the others. Now, the, it's very clear in the in one of the sutras is that these five are likened respectively to um, a ball of foam on a river. So the, what's, what appears to be solid, and by the way, when it talks about form, it's not only the body, it's also um, solid, you know, objects, objects out in the world that the body interacts with. It all seems to be solid, you know, but it's like a ball of foam. It's trying to describe, I think, you know, what it's like when we're disen disentranced, when the constructs are no longer fooling us. I mean, it sounds a bit harsh because we, we need to, to some extent, we need to have these constructs to sort of have constructive lives or, you know, have helpful lives in the world. So, but it's so different if we have also seen through them. If we've seen that what seems to be solid is actually, you know, you could put your finger right through it, like through a ball of foam. The finger itself is a ball of foam. You know, all the, you know, yeah, say, well, look, you know, I could hit you and that doesn't feel like a ball of foam. But that's, that's just describing the whole construct of these five skandhas. See what I mean? So the second one is that it's like a bubble on a stream, just a single bubble on a stream. That's how, what it's really like. It doesn't feel that way, but that's what it's really like. And the third one is um, like a mirage over a hot road. Well, we all know that, you know, mirages looks like a lake or a pond or a puddle or, you know, it's, it's not there, simply not there. And uh, I've let, I've, oh, and the fourth one is um, a conjurer's trick. Like, a, well, the, maybe the fourth one is the plantain tree. The plantain tree basically has no trunk. 
it looks like it does but if you pull the the the, the sort of fronds off it, it, there's no trunk in there they, they just it's made of the stems of the fronds yes you know there's no trunk in there but it looks like there is and lastly there's a you know a conjuring trick in a marketplace so this whole kind of you know sphere of experience that we're sitting in each of us apparently you know is actually made of mirages it's sort of what that's saying so they're not the constructs and of course this particular parsing out these scandals is helping us to be less convinced by the sense of self and the things that we cling to as mine my life my experience all these elements of it they're not the solid things they appear to be it's kind of what it's saying therefore constructs don't exactly dissolve they're seen through now um where do koans fit in with this well all koans i think the simplest way to put it is that they they are coming from speaking from um you know that the disentranced world the world of awake of awakened awareness where um it's it's all seen as you know foam bubble etc where that's clear that it's not as um solidity has been um seen through so all the koans are are just trying to share that with us and it's real it's real so it's not like they've got to make us they've not they haven't got to dry, help us construct some other reality they've just they're just there to help us drop the veil of how we think things are so um why do they help how do they help um well you know honestly that's what i want to talk to on the next retreat because mu is the first koan and it's the first crucial sort of um you know liberative moment on this level this is a deep level of of practice by the way that koans are operating on and i want to i will in fact in this upcoming retreat i want to explain how mu is a uh, particularly helpful as a first kind because it also helps on other levels it helps us with simply developing mindfulness it helps us with trusting so that there's support in our practice it helps us with developing moving into absorption jhana states and then it, of course it helps with, with with what it would see as this or what is often extolled as its primary purpose you know helping us to break down the door of our delusions and and uh come into bloom so to speak that let the mind heart bloom excuse me is this is this okay i mean is is what i'm saying um is it landing in any way is it sort of um it's kind of a i don't know if it's making sense or not but it, it's okay yeah <laughs> okay well i'll just keep going i'll just keep going great okay i really love the sensibility of sambo zen okay this was a question about is there sambo zen in the pacific northwest i think there there nearly is right valerie with um leanne i think she's kind of there's i don't think there is exactly but there are teachers who are related and um uh we ought to put together a list actually and uh, have it be available of uh, you know it's the the truth is that this lineage has been highly influential in the world of american uh zen practice but very few teachers sort of a really uh sort of strictly part of it you know there was i mean for example mazumi roshi who came over in the uh i guess 70s and 80s 60s 70s 80s something like that he was trained in three different zen lineages one of which was sambo zen and the way he handled koans was sambo zen's way more or less very slightly different but basically the same and so he trained you know bernie glassman roshi and um pat enkyo ohara i think and 
various others, um, Charlotte Joko, Bak Roshi, and you know, and on. But those folks, I mean, some probably still do the koan training in a rather similar way, but many don't. They they sort of they they went off in other directions. Um, and then there's um, and then John Dido Lori Roshi at Zen Mountain Monastery. He was trained by Mazumi Roshi as well. And you know, again, they do something probably I would think they're quite similar, actually. But um, so I think it's easy to get something. And then of course there was Robert Aiken Roshi with a diamond sangha. They were they were very close. And how close they still are, I don't really know, but probably quite. Um, so that's it's around. If it's not, even if it's not exactly Sambo Zen. I noticed in tricycle years ago, somebody saying in a sort of little blurb at the back about a Zen center saying something like, you know, trained in this, trained in that, trained in Sambo, Kyodan, Koans. So, so that's the Sambo Kyodan is what Sambo Zen used to be called. So they were sort of saying that they, they, they were using this method of Koans, even though they weren't officially part of it. So, you know, it, I think it's around. Um, yeah, how does Sambo Zen approach working with the 16 Bodhisattva precepts? Does Sambo Zen encourage the formal taking of precepts at Jukai? Yeah, this is a good, good point, like the others. Um, another good question. Um, we, we, the way we do it in Sambo Zen, actually, is usually when somebody's finished koan study, that's when we do precept study of these 16 precepts. And... Um, the precepts, you know, are, are the um, guidance in how to live wholesomely and less harmfully. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, don't misuse sex, don't use intoxicants. And then there's another, those are the five grave precepts of Buddhism generally. And then the Mahayana precepts have some additional ones. And then they have three further ones and another three, which makes 16. And um, so we study them after koan study, looking at them as koans, actually. Now, um, that's the trad way in Sambo Zen, but I have been pondering it a little bit myself, I must say, and wondering whether we ought to um, bring them in earlier. And then people take Jukai if they want to, you know, which is the formal taking of precepts. If they want to do that, we can do that later. Uh, after studying them but actually we we did we did we did a we had a precept study group at mountain cloud um within the last 10 years i can't remember where it when maybe six or seven or eight years ago we did it over several months and maybe we'll we'll reinstate that i think it's probably a, a good thing to do so carrying on you mentioned a koan about death meeting life yesterday I don't, I don't remember. I'm sorry. Um, but I think in a way, every koan brings somehow, somehow the reality of every koan brings together life and death. It shows that there's a level of our experience, of our consciousness, of our life, where what life and death are is, is somehow not what we usually think. And they're not quite, it's not quite right to see them the way we usually do on that level. Um, but I, I don't think I want to go into that terribly much right now. Does Zen meditation embrace both concentration and open focus? And the answer to that is yes. Traditionally, um, early practice and practice with a koan has been a concentration practice of focusing on 
a single object, usually breath, and then maybe starting to do it with a koan. And the open focus practice has been in what's known as shikantaza or just sitting, which is another form of practice where you, you simply don't have any method. You don't have, you don't follow the breath. You don't, you certainly don't have a koan. You just sit and it's known as just sitting because the practice is nothing more or less than sitting, just sitting is the practice. Now, so it wouldn't even describe itself really as an open focus practice, but it is an open focus practice. Everything is freely allowed to arise in it. Wide open, open awareness, open presence, choiceless awareness, open focus. Now, I want to just make the point that concentration is a is a is a slightly tricky word in practice because um, the word samadhi is often translated as concentration. But but actually, I think in this question, the term that is being translated as concentration is actually samatha. A samatha practice is where you focus on usually breath, actually, to the exclusion of all else. And it can take you through, um, you know, early settling practice all the way to these jhana states that I mentioned earlier. And so, but samatha, I think, is the term often used for that. Whereas samadhi is, can be sort of reached through various kinds of practice, including classic sort of mindfulness, sati practice. Okay. Um, if there is no knowing, then what is there to learn? <laughs> I, I don't know what, I, I assume this is some kind of tricky question, probably right on the money, right on the bullseye, based on something I've said during the retreat. If there is no knowing, then what is there to learn? Well, I mean, honestly, I think it's right, fair to say this is a practice of unlearning. Right on. With a good question. The question's right. <laughs> what is there to learn? Precisely. Precisely. In fact, I, I, I wrote just a little paragraph last night while I was sitting, suddenly this came to me, you know, what if, you know, we cannot know what is real? What if we are simply, if we let ourselves give up knowing what's real? I mean, often, sometimes, people might say about their practice, I wanted to know reality. I wanted to know what was real. That's why I took up practice. I wanted to know reality. But what if, if you were told you can't? All we can do is let go of what we think we know. What would it be like to let go of what we think we know and not land on some new knowing? What would that be like? What would that be like just to entertain that possibility? I can't know what is real. I'd like you to just Bring that into your practice just as a question. How would it be? How is it if I can't know what is real? Now, this isn't supposed to put you into a tailspin of existential horror. Not at all. It's supposed to just encourage you to let go. Let the fingers release a little bit. They want, they want to know. You know, one, I remember Ruben Habito Roshi once at the beginning of a retreat saying, there's three things we want. We want to possess things. We want 
comfort and we want to know things have to have to know and to be comfortable basically in this practice to some extent you're deprived of those the comfort is taken away because you sit you have to sit you know well, i mean you're encouraged to sit eat less no distractions you and the wall you and your body your mind your heart and the wall make friends with them you know no external aids of comfort and distraction have to at least for the stretch of the the retreat no you don't really get to have very much now this could of course be applied further to how we approach life and our motivations in life around acquisition possession and then knowing you're encouraged you're given a context to stop knowing stuff to release the knowing and to release the need for knowing i mean that's part of its wonder is is to find that we can let those things go and what a balm to the human heart that is what an ease to the soul what a joy what a joy to be released from those ah yeah and that's what this sitting is about you know it's really down to the sitting okay so we're going to be um we're going to have to stop there and I, i'm going to i'm going to mark where where i sort of got to so that i can pick it up again in the next talk and just carry on because uh yeah i think these are these are all extremely good questions though i'm very grateful to everybody who asked a question thank you very much and we'll carry on so um yeah hey why don't we just unmute and um uh you know have a have a couple of minutes where we can just sort of greet one another in any random way <laughs>